Kevin Bowen, featured writer for Colts.com, joining us now. Kevin, how's things? Things are well. How about you guys? Not too bad. At Thanksgiving, treat you all right? I know you had to work a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I know you had to no little... complaints. I spent a little bit of time with the with the family, and uh, now I guess back on the grind. That's right, back on the grind, <laughs> and gritting it out. Uh, that's what we're doing here. So, uh, three game win streak. Hasselback is four and zero. He's a forty year old guy. Blah 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 blah. We know the storylines there. We were talking about this yesterday uh, when when we were discussing Sunday's game. It looks to me like the offensive line seems to protect him a little better, although I think you could make an argument, and I want your thoughts on this too. Is it the offensive line protecting him better, or is it the fact that he gets rid of the ball quicker than Andrew Luck does that gives this illusion that the offensive line is protecting him longer? I I, I would point to him getting the ball out a little bit quicker um, as kind of the major reason why I think pro football focus, which, you know, spits out all these analytics every week. And I saw a stat a couple of weeks ago that Tom Brady and Andy Dalton were the only quarterbacks in the league that got the ball out quicker than Matt. So I think he had a great quote a couple of eight weeks ago. You know, I know my limitations with what he said. And he, he's not going to take seven-step drops and scramble around in the pocket and keep plays alive and, you know, try to hit the big chunk plays down the field. This is a guy that knows where his playmakers are. He knows where to get those guys. And it falls in the offense. And he knows that he just can't sit back there again, for you know, four and five seconds and try to hit hit those chunk plays. So I, I would point more to the credit of Matt. But at the same time, I thought Joe Wright, the left tackle, Denzel Cahood playing his first ever NFL game. I thought those two guys, outside of a few penalties for good, but those two guys played pretty well in spots that they've never played before uh, in terms of starting the NFL. Do you know, have they have they tweaked the playbook at all to fit Hasselbeck's uh, capabilities? Because, again, a guy that typically doesn't chuck it down the field, maybe doesn't have the arm right. strength as an Andrew Luck to do such a thing, although he had some deep balls, uh, hit T.Y. on a couple of them, uh, set up by a play action. Are they, are they Have they tweaked the play calling a little bit to fit his style, or have they pretty much stuck with what they would have normally called if Andrew was in there? I think to a degree that they've done that, especially when, it, and, you, and you touched on all the play action passes. I think ESPN had a stat where, you know, I think Hasselbeck had 17 play action passes on Sunday and the win over Tampa Bay. That's most of any quarterback in the league. So they've definitely wanted to establish the run a lot more. Now, it hasn't been as successful in past weeks, and some of that is we played some of the best run defenses in the league, but they are running the ball a lot more frequently under Rod Sadzinski than they were under Beth Hamilton. So I think that has something to do with it. I know against Atlanta, only one of his completions were was further than nine yards through the air, whereas Again, on Sunday, you saw a little bit more of an aggressive, I think, passing attack, and I think that was a byproduct of, okay, in the first half, you play a little too safe in the red zone, you're down 12-6, to you aren't able to get the run, and then all of a sudden, you come on the second half, T.Y. Hilton starts get some chunk plays, Dante Moncrief gets involved a lot more. So I think a little bit has to do with the play calling because when you came out of that bye week, and Rod Sizinski really got that first you know, full week of preparation under his belt, he also knew that his quarterback was going to be Matt Hasselbeck and not Andrew Luck. I knew that it was going to be Hasselbeck for at least a couple of weeks. So I think that helped out this offense as well, that you knew going coming out of the bye week who your starting quarterback was going to be and what his strengths are. Well, that kind of leads into my, my question for you, Kevin. I'm wondering, we've not seen Coach Chud really go at it with Andrew Luck yet. Is the, the play calling and, and the getting the ball out quicker, a lot more runs, things like that, is that more to do with with Chudinsky's calling versus Pep Hamilton, or is it to do with with Hasselback and Chud kind of working together because it's not Andrew Luck back there? I would say more the latter. I think again, Chud knew that again Hasselback was going to be his guy for the next couple of weeks, so you want to cater to what that quarterback does well. I mean, we did see in the Denver game when Andrew Luck was under center with Chud, albeit a short week. But that was arguably, and I actually I don't even think arguably, when you consider you're playing their own one defense in the league, that was the best this offense has looked all year. And so I do think once Andrew Luck gets back, you still are going to have to rely on some of those big plays, which has been a staple of this offense. And we saw that on, on Sunday. I mean, when this offense was kind of a little bit sluggish and you needed some sort of sparks, you know, you had a big play to Moncrief down the sideline, and then that opens things up. And then Hilton got more involved as well. So I still think that, the big plays have got to be a byproduct of this offense because you just can't ignore the speed and the dynamic ability of T.Y. Hilton and Dante Moncrief. And on Sunday they played, I would say, probably their best combined game here of 2015. So I think the biggest thing with Chud is he's going to stay committed to the ground, and that's going to be tested now in the coming weeks with Frank Gore a little bit beat up. And now you, there's no you know, 
Boom Heron, you know what he can do, but he's a lot different than Ahmad. So I think that's going to be something to watch going forward now is how the kind of the Colts divvy up their running back reps because Brett Gore is a little beat up and Boom Heron has only been there for about a week. Kevin Bowen, Colts.com featured rider, featured rider, excuse me, joining us on the Menard Studio Hotline, Ford and O'Brien, ESP in Evansville, 1053 and online, ESP in Evansville.com. Sticking with that offensive line, I'll tell you what I've noticed here in these three wins, uh, that is that wasn't there in the the kind of uglier games, for lack of a better term, to start the season. It seems that the penalties have decreased. Is that due to yeah. the shakeup? And I know we when we talked last week, I think there was you had made some comments that they had kind of shuffled some guys around to trying to find the right combination of guys on that offensive line. Is that just a natural byproduct of that, or has there been more emphasis in practices to be, hey, when Frank runs for eight, nine yards, let's make sure he does it legitimately and not because somebody held a defender? Right. No, I, I think it's something that's been stressed. And Chuck Lagano, you know, back in 2013, one of the reasons this team was so effective during that season and, you know, beat Denver and beat Seattle and went to San Francisco and beat them was – they're the fewest penalized team in the league, and they committed the fewest turnovers as well in 2013, setting franchise marks in both those. So that's why this year is like such an anomaly when you see all these penalties early on in the year. And like we've talked about, it just seemed like they were on a ton of big plays, especially big Frank Gore runs. So I think once you had that continuity of the line, you know, week three was when the really the shuffling occurred. Joe Wright's into the starting lineup. Hugh Thornton into the starting lineup on the right side. Jack Muhort sliding back over to left guard. You had that continuity in there for several weeks. I think those guys playing together, uh, having that communication across that line, I think that's where kind of the pre-snap penalties and the holding penalties have definitely quieted down. And we should mention the Colts have benefited a lot from other teams' penalties. Um, I think I read a stat today where uh, the Colts have, I guess, received the most penalties against them. I don't know if that's the proper term, but, but from a yards and a number of penalty standpoints, teams have committed a league high amount against the Colts. So we saw it again on Sunday that kind of running into the holder penalty uh, late in the fourth quarter allowed the Colts then to get that touchdown to T.Y. Hill and then really seal the game. So uh, disciplined football, I mean, you see it each week. It's simple to say and it seems obvious and it's taught at the Pop Warner level and up, but it's a big reason why I think the Colts now have won three in a row and have really played pretty good football since that Saints game. Yeah, I think it's been almost uh, just watching the last three weeks, or at least the last three games. I know the bye was in there. It, it almost It's like watching two separate football teams, really, with yeah. the way the season has started. And trust me, I was ready to, you know, even as, as long of a fan as I've been, I was about ready to write them off after about week <laughs> five. Uh, you mentioned Denzel Good uh, making his first start in the NFL. Uh, just some thoughts on his, on his play, because I noticed they, they referenced him quite a few times on the television broadcast on Fox. Uh, and he, I know he had a penalty or two against him, but all in all, a pretty solid outing for his first go around. I would say definitely. Again, the penalties, put those aside because again, those have to be cleaned up. But I thought he did a re- really good job, and Chuck Pagano was very impressed by him, saying you know he looked dominant at times. And when you think about the, this new regime in these past three or four years, you know, they really looked for a young tackle. And now I think you finally have a third tackle once Anthony Costanzo gets back that you feel comfortable putting in the starting lineup. I mean, it's remarkable that that kid, you know, last year was playing Division II football at Mars Hill University in North Carolina, you know, playing in front of hundreds of fans, not even thousands of fans. And then he sits inactive for the first 10 weeks of the season and then comes out there on Sunday and does a very nice, nice job, I think, kind of solidifying that right side of the line. So, I think when you consider where he came from and the limited NFL experience that he has, to go thrown into the mix, thrown into the fire like that, you know, in week 12 of the NFL with this team in the thick of a playoff race, I thought he played very, very well. Now it's going to be a test going to Pittsburgh. You know, we all know how hostile that environment is, especially for an offensive line, though, with that crowd noise and everything. But all in all, I thought Denzel Good played very well. And, you know, now you maybe have some edge tackle depth behind Wrights and Costanzo that – you've really never had in the past three or three or four years. Kevin Bowen, Colts.com featured writer joining us. It's Ford and, Ford and O'Brien, ESPN Evansville, 105.3 and online, ESPN Evansville.com. You mentioned Costanzo. Obviously, we know uh, still dealing with the injury. We know this injury situation with Ahmad Bradshaw. Very unfortunate. He's going to end the third consecutive season on IR. Uh, where are we at with Costanzo, Luck, Freeman? What's the latest on, on the, the key guys there? 
Yeah, Costanzo's still week to week of that sprained MCL, and week to week in Chuck Pagano terms usually means the guy's going to miss at least Sunday. So it looks like Denzel Good will be back in the starting lineup still week to week on Andrew Luck. So again, going forward, Matt Hasselbeck going to be under center. It'll be kind of a rematch of Super Bowl Forty from ten years ago with Matt Hasselbeck and the long as Ben Roethlisberger can clear the concussion protocol. You know that'll be a little bit of a crazy rematch. Thinking ten years ago they were playing in the Super Bowl, and now they're still having their teams in a playoff race. Sherelle Freeman, I think, is the big injury to watch. That is a grade two hamstring injury. Um, he's also listed as week to week. So I think he's played extremely productive football for this team this year. Him and Nicole Jackson, I think, have merited some Pro Bowl consideration. Uh, so without Freeman, that's obviously a big loss. I did think Nate Irving filled in nicely for him kind of in the fourth quarter. Irving had a sack. Irving had a pass deflection as well on a key fourth down play in the red zone, and I do think the Colts could play a little more nickel and dime this week going up against that potent Pittsburgh passing attack. So you might not feel that Freeman loss from a pure personnel standpoint just because you are going to have probably extra defensive backs on the field, but I think Freeman has played very, very well here in 2015. So nothing season-ending or anything like that, but uh, a week-to-week diagnosis for him so he could definitely miss a game or two. And and Lux latest are we still just week to week on him? Are they still eyeballing yeah, the Miami yeah, still, game or what? Are, you know, I know I know Pagano made a comment. I believe it was yesterday where he said, and and I know some people have latched onto this number uh, in some of the the comments I've noticed. Uh, you know that he would come back when he is one hundred percent. Now, you know what is that? When is one hundred percent? Is it just whatever right. the doctors say or? Are you going, is that an excuse to ride Matt Hasselback through the rest of the, you know, who knows? Well, there's all kinds of speculation, but where where are we with Andrew? Yeah, it's still week to week, and I, I would think it's more of a doctor thing, 100% when you're talking about an organ. You know, this is a kidney, this isn't an ankle, this isn't a shoulder, this isn't a knee. You know, you can play on a bum ankle, you can't play on a bum kidney. So I think that's where the 100% diagnosis or, you know, remedy that, the Colts want to see that's when I think he's going to be back on the field because, again, it's such a serious injury. And that's why, as you approach the three week timetable now, and I think it was two to six was the original timetable, I think today actually, I think, is the, the third week. That's why it looks like it's getting into the back end of this because, again, this is something that you just don't really deal with many of these, you know, lacerated kidneys. You just don't see guys suffer those during a season and uh, I think that's why it's so hard to predict when when he comes back so and at the same time you know there's no rush to get him back on the field when you look at how well uh, Matt has played this year so it's definitely a luxury for the Colts and you look down the road you got Houston with a great defensive line Miami with a, with a great defensive line I think the Titans despite their struggles I think they lead the league in sacks this year so you got some very good defensive lines I think you got to take that in consideration too when you want to throw him back into the fire it's Kevin Bowen, featured writer, Colts.com. You can also find him on Twitter, of course, at KBowenColts. Always appreciate the time, Kevin. We'll talk again next week. Can't wait. Thanks, guys. All right, take care.